just on a few administrative issues while they have a while you're handing your assignments. Um, the midterms are mostly graded, or somewhat mostly graded, so it's taking a lot longer than I thought. Um, the grades for assignments one, two, and three will be posted on Avenue either today or tomorrow. Darren was just working on getting that in. Uh, and it just takes a little bit of getting used to uh, putting grades in. Uh, so he's, he's taking care of that. Then, I, what I also thought to do is I won't have assignments, uh, sorry, the mention fully graded by the end of the week. So what I will do, however, is post the grades we have on the questions we've got graded so far on the midterm. We'll post those and have a good, so you, because I, I think from that is sometimes this week, right? Not, I don't know any of the plans from the but if you do need this sort of information to help make that decision, we will get those partial midterm grades on Avenue. Um, but bear in mind that, that it's not a not the complete midterm grade, so just make sure you understand that when you see the midterm grade, that you realize that you didn't do the average before you have a grade. It's not a full grade so. Okay, so we'll post it question by question by question so you can see what, what the division grades are doing. Okay. Um, so everyone got their assignments in. Let's take a look. Primarily I just wanted to just talk about question two here, and then we'll talk a little bit about question five. The reason why I want to go through this question is to just make sure that our thinking on membranes is, is, is on the same, on the, same line. Um, the reason is, this is probably a, a, a very representative question that you'll see in the take home exam. Um, it is on the longish side for a final exam type question. So the aspects of a, a great for a final exam question, but the whole question in and of itself is, is a bit too long as you, as you realize. <laughs> So let's just take a look at our understanding here. The question is asking to look at an ultrafiltration membrane. And we're wanting to separate dyes from the liquid stream. This is a very typical application where the dyes, say for a car manufacturing, uh, when they're painting those cars, the dye um, is the cars are washed after they're painted and then dye comes off in the wastewater. They cannot set that down and discharge it. So what they'd like to do is they've concentrated up to 20 kilograms per meter cube. The reason is if they can get it up to that concentration, they can reuse that to die. Okay, so it's, it's the, that's the main reason for concentrating it up. And then the permeate, uh, that wash water then that comes out, essentially free of dye, is then used to for future washing as well. So it's a very tightly integrated system. And these sorts of systems um, pay pay back for these car companies within a matter of months. Just the savings on, on saving that dye and savings on wastewater pay back very rapidly. So it's a, it's a, it's a typical application over here. We're given um, then that the volumetric cross JV for a particular membrane um, is, is by that equation. And then we have the constraints that we can purchase these membranes as Hank Kroop showed in the beginning from Team on OGE, I should say. So these units are sold in modules. So it's, it's very typical that you, you can't, if you calculated that I need a membrane area of 46 meters square, you cannot purchase a membrane of that size. They are purchased in discrete modules. And the key insight to understanding this question is that if I purchase one module, it's 30 meters square, but I need a total of of let's say at least 90 meters squared, I simply just put them in parallel and I feed my wastewater in multiple membranes of 30 meters squared, 30 meters squared, and I collect these streams out and I've got effectively a 90 meters squared membrane. So by placing them in parallel, I'm just, I'm just adding to my membrane's capacity. This question then goes on to talking about, well, what if we put them, let's take this group, this is now called collection of modules, we'll call this a unit. So here's my, my one unit. Inside my unit, I have a module, or modules, I should say. If I take these modules, combine them into units, what's going to happen if I combine multiple units together? but in series, okay? So we've got parallel internals, but we're placing the units in series. <laughs> so if we put a certain wastewater stream in over here, coming in with a certain concentration in the feed, 
we're going to get an intermediate concentration C1 and then a final concentration C2, for example, in the outcome. Let's call this the retent takes you to get this, so CR1, CR2. So every time I go from one unit to the other, I'm going to increase that concentration by retent takes stream, increase the concentration by retent takes stream. Coming off here, I'm going to collect my permeates internally. My permeates are going to come off in CP1 and QP1, and then CP2 and QP2. So that's, that's the thinking that we're, we're asking. So let's take a look then at this question. It says, if we're considering the system, what is the flow rate of clean water we would get from, from, from the system? And then the second part of the question is, how many modules would we, we, we require to purchase for a single feed and weed configuration? So that's referring to the number of internal units we require. So we calculate the overall area, and then we find the closest number of units to meet that. To meet that. OK, so let's draw. <coughs> Then a diagram then to take a look at this question. So here's my feed coming in at your edge and CF or I guess most of you have been using the notation Q0 or C0, so I'll stick to that rather than. There is an internal recycle over here. And the retentate leaves over here with QR1 and CR1. Our permeate leaves then with QP1 and CP1. What we're concerned about is the overall mass balance. We're not really concerned about this internal recycle that takes place. Uh, that's, we're going to build our boundary internal to that. So if we look at what we're given, we're given Q0, that incoming flow rate is 2 meters cubed per hour, and C0 is 0.5 kilograms per meter cubed. So those are our knowns. Then from an overall mass balance, we get Q0, C0 is equal to QR1, CR1, plus essentially assuming nothing in the permeate. So if I write the QP1, CP1, that CP1 term is, is, is zero. And the standard assumption for, for ultrafiltration is that no, none of our dye comes out in the permeate. Our volumetric balance Q0 is equal to QR1, the retentate flow plus the permeate flow. And this equation for JV, the volumetric flux, that refers to the permeates flow, so QP1 divided by the area of the total number of modules is equal to 0 0.041 of 25 divided by C, refers to CR1 in this case, making the assumption that the retentate is the bulk, the bulk flow, bulk concentration. So this is, uh, this is something these concepts are comfortable now. So rearranging those, we can then solve. We've got um, C0, C0. We can, uh, the question asks, what is the flow of the clean water from the system? So QP1 is something we're looking for. So this is an unknown. CR1 and QR1. Sorry, we know CR1 is desired to be 20 kilograms per meter. So substituting those in, we can solve them for this equation. QR1 is equal to Q0 C0 divided by CR1, which is 20. That gets you 0 0.075 meters cube per hour. So that's my retentate flow, very, very small volumetric flow rate. And then QP1, by the difference is equal to 3 minus 0.075 is 2.9, 25 meters cubed per hour. And then solving for A1, the only other unknown in that system is 327.7 meters squared required, which is 11 million modules.
So we've, we've, we've purchased then 11 of those smaller modules and put those 11 in parallel inside this overall unit. So I've essentially answered question one and two days and Okay, so that should be straightforward. Anything unclear on that question? Now the next question is, um, is, is really we have to uh, consider the system a bit more conceptually. And what we're doing is we're saying, well, we've had to purchase 11 modules over here. That could be a substantial investment. What this next question looks at is actually it's quite interesting. It will show that by, by putting these units in series, we can actually make a much smaller investments and still achieve the same goal. The, the concept is as follows. If I put this first unit, so this is my first feed and lead stage, this entire block that I've drawn up here, I'm just reducing down to a single square. Coming out of that is CR1. And this overall block is A1. Coming into it is the feed C0. Then I can get to a second module, a second set of modules, and coming out of that is CR2. So CR2 is, is our target. We know that we want that to be 20 <coughs> kilograms per meter cubed. We know what C0 is, our feed coming in is 0 0.05 kilograms per meter cubed. CR1 is, definite, is, is clearly a number that's between 0.5 on my inlet and 20 on my outlet, on my desired outlet. So this intermediate concentration in the retentate of dye is some number that's between 0 0.5 and 20. And the reason it's, it's a fairly broad range, but I can adjust that range by adjusting what these areas are. If I have a really small area of membrane in that first unit, CR1 is going to be only just a little higher than the incoming feed. If I increase that area, CR1 is going to get greater and greater. And that means that I need a corresponding smaller area in A2. So for a really large A1, I only need a small area in A2 in order to achieve the final goal. Or vice versa. I can go to a really small, a uh, large area in A, uh, sorry, a large, small area in A1, and then I just need a, a block. Sorry, what did I say first? Large and then small, smaller than large. So there's, there's definitely a trade-off over there. And it's not, and it's counterintuitive perhaps, but it's not simply just taking these 11 modules that you require for a single unit and simply distributing them between the two. So it's not like five plus six modules would work and get you that or 4 plus, plus 7. So when you do the calculations then, you will actually see we've got an additional unknown, we've got three unknowns, two equations, but really this CR1 is a variable that is, while it's interesting, we don't care for it too much. It's just some intermediate concentration. The main goal that we're after is to make sure CR2 gets us 20 kilograms per meter cube. So let's Let's set up those equations then. I'm going to erase these over here on the right hand side. And just add to this notation over here that this now essentially becomes my feed to the next module. Internal recycle is QR2 and CR2, and my permeate moving QP2 and CP2. So from, from before as well, I'm just going to write my mass balance as Q0, C0 is equal to QR1, CR1 plus. R2, CR2. So that's my, my uh, mass balance. Then I've got volumetric balances as well. Q0 
is equal to QP1 plus QR1. So that's on my first membrane. Let's substitute in some of those numbers over there. That's 3.0. Now QP1 is equal to Two equations and two unknowns. 
So, for example, we know that CR1, as I said earlier, needs to be between 0.5 and 20. So, I, when I did this the first time, I just started as my guessing a value of 8 kilograms per meters cubed. Then you get a value for A1 of 61.7 and A2, 12.6. That would require you to purchase, in fact, three modules for A1 and one module for A2. So if I just add that information here. So in square brackets is the number of modules you'd have to purchase. Then I tried eight, uh, 12 afterwards, so I'm going to a higher concentration then in this intermediate. I would definitely need a larger area than A1 to achieve that higher concentration. That came up to 98 meters squared, which would require purchasing four modules. And then A2 is then only 5.6 meters squared required, still only requires purchasing a single module. So here, I either purchase four overall modules, or here in the second option with CR1 is 12, I'm buying five modules. <coughs> then I went a little bit lower, said, well, let me try four. And that gave me an area of 35, uh, sorry, 36 meters squared. That's two membranes, two modules there. And then the second area was 34 <coughs> meters squared. That also requires purchasing two modules. So still a total of four. And then I tried one final iteration with five, and that came down to purchasing two modules in one module. But by that time, I had actually just uh, done it up in a spreadsheet, which I, I think most of you ended up doing anyway. So depending on how your spreadsheet was set up, you could get something that looks like this, where you set up those columns of CR1, A1, and A2. So let's just take a look at a bit what my graph is doing here. The smooth line, so let's just talk about the x-axis, that's CR1. So it ranges between values of about 1 up to 12. This smooth line here represents the area in A2 required, and then this blue line represents the area required in A1. So simply a trade-off as, as I make A1 bigger, A2's required area and smaller and smaller to get to that total. The optimum is where those two lines cross. That's the minimum total area required, is where those two lines cross. But that's not a, a viable option because we have to purchase these in discrete units. So then that's what these step lines represent, is the green step line represents the, the number of modules required for A1. So there I need 30 meters squared, then I need to jump to 60, 90, and so on and then A2 step down. So the, the smallest combination is over here where you need two units plus one unit, two modules plus one unit. But it's a very broad optimum, okay? It's a, there's a range of concentrations over which that same configuration works well. That's the key, so if your answers, the reason why I wanted to go through this is the answer that you get for CR1 is going to be different in, in every case, depending on where, where you decided to put your CR1 value. There's a fairly broad range of optimum possible. Okay, any, anything unclear about this, this construction? So, okay, I think most of you most of you figured this out. Then the final uh, parts of the question, just uh, just to go through that and then we'll move on. Um, so for the optimal arrangement, you choose specify what would be the total flows of clean water. So if the optimal arrangement was two, two modules over here. So that implies A1 now is 60 meters squared, and the optimal arrangement was 30 meters squared. What is the total flow of clean water? It's tempting to assume it's the same as previously. The reason is, 
Okay, so the total, let's first say the total flow of clean water is QP1 plus QP2. So we agree on that. But what's tempting is to simply take your optimum, which might have been something like 55 meters squared for A1 and 25 meters squared for A2, and then just use those QPs. What you have to recognize is that once I've put in these discrete modules of 30 meters squared each time, I've got a total area here of 60 meters squared, and here's 30 meters squared. My QP1 isn't what I calculated from before, from step three. My QP1, I have to recompute what QP1 is because my area A1 is now a solid 60 meters squared. So don't just repeat your answer from part three, um, the, the intermediate QP1 and QP2 that you calculated up in part three as your answer for part four. Yes, Sean. How would you go about iterating the optimal flows and like we CR? So we're we're saying we are right. Okay, so you could go into like infinite resub uh, infinite. So, but recognize what we've done. You can't purchase a membrane of 61.7 meters squared to get that CR1 value. You've got to purchase these in discrete sizes. So if A1 now is 60 meters squared, part four actually requires you to redo the whole question again. <laughs> it's back to the midterm question. You're given A1, you're given the entry conditions, recalculate QP1, CP1, QR1, and CR1. So part four is actually quite a bit of work. But what's it going to be? Okay, it's just stating what it's going to be. No, is it going to be higher or lower? Okay, so let's so let's think about it. Previously, I, I, I let's say I calculated 57 meters squared required here. I've now put in a membrane of 60 meters squared. And if I had calculated that that 57 meters squared would give me a CR1 of let's say five. I'm now going to get 5.5 or 6, and going to get a higher CO1. Now that's coming into this membrane, which let's say by calculation required 25 meters squared, and now I'm putting in 30. So now I'm putting in a more concentrated feed, I'm going to get an even more concentrated CO2. I'm going to exceed my target of 20 meters squared, of 20 kilograms per meter cubed. And there's nothing we can do about that because we're forced to buy these in discrete sizes. Okay, so part 5. Uh, sorry, part four, you have to repeat your calculations again from this time from front to back, saying now my A1 is the known portion and CR1 becomes unknown, CR2 becomes unknown, QP1 and QP2 are also unknown. And then okay, so a bit more work has to be done for part four of that question. Part five says what would you do, uh, what are your thoughts on putting four, four stages in series? Waste of time, good value of some money. Waste of time. So if, if for two units in series, we only require two plus one. Three units in series, for sure, it's probably going to be one plus one plus one. Four units in series, you don't, you don't, you don't need a fourth unit to achieve this. Okay, so we can get away with three modules of 30 meters squared. So three times 30 meters squared. That's 90 meters squared of membrane to purchase in two units in series versus single membrane of 11 times 30. So a tremendous saving by putting these two in series, but you don't keep, it's not like those savings keep going as you put more modules in series. And if you're casting this out in 4N, for example, and then you're trading off membrane area versus the actual unit itself. So every time I put another unit in series, I've got more, more capital cost for piping and the, and the, and the physical unit itself. So definitely there's an option there. Okay, sorry, I just not have a question. Uh, did you bring this question up? Yes. Yeah, this is, uh, you don't find this stuff in textbooks too easily. Okay, so let's, um, any, any questions on this assignment? Okay, then the only thing is in question five, I will, rather than, I'm not going to go through it now, I will post uh, the solution online, I think, uh, We've, from the questions we had in class on Friday, uh, I, I'm sure most of you are comfortable with this with this question now. Um, it, is, it is iterative. You, you should do this one in a spreadsheet. This is not something you would do by
by hand uh, just because of those messy calculations. So I'll, I'll pause that, that, that one on time. So let's um, move over then to the new topic of absorption. Coconut shells. 
that's my adsorb limit, my adsorb rate, is then the impurities in the fluid stream that are going to bind to that black adsorbent. I'm not concerned on recovering those impurities. I'm going to, in fact, throw this limit around once this useful life is over. Um, so when we say that the adsorbent solute is of interest, it may not be of financial interest. We just, it's of interest to remove. The adsorbent then is my mass separating agent. So that's the activated carbon, that solid particle, that insoluble rigid particle that's suspended in a vessel. So that plastic reader filter, that's my vessel. That activated carbon is my mass separating agent. Is there an energy separating agent? In, the, in, this, in this particular example of the reader filter. Maybe, yeah. It's a free one, I guess, yeah. And generally, uh, they, we, we will see that there is an energy separating agent. The energy separating agent comes in later on when we wish to recover and regenerate that adsorbent. So that adsorbent becomes used up. If, we, if it's an expensive adsorbent, we wish to recover it, and the way we recover that and get it back into use again is by putting energy in to undo the adsorption step. But if I'm going to throw away my adsorbent with the adsorbent afterwards, then I'm not going to put it in the ESA, because it's just going to be tossed out. OK, so let's just, uh, let's just make a distinction here. Adsorption, the B, is something you've considered in 3M. We will not look at that anymore in this course. It is also a strict adsorption process. Your, your gas that's coming in is your solute. It's being transferred to an insoluble particle, in this case, a liquid. Um, so that's how I put rigid, rigid in brackets, because the insoluble particle you're transferring your, your gas into is, 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 is that. But we're not going to look into that. What we're more concerned about in these few classes coming up is where we're binding molecules onto that solid surface. Now, ion exchange is a very similar process, except we've got this reversible reaction taking place. Let's take the water softening example. We've got calcium ions dissolved in our water. And what we're going to do is the solid ion exchange resin, sodium resin, that R capital R is the, is the other component of it. What we're going to do is we're going to exchange our ions. So we're going to bind calcium then to that resin and let sodium go into aqueous phase solution. So we're exchanging the ions, the calcium coming in in our water for sodium. We're actually going to have a slightly salty type water leaving in exchange for softening by removing calcium. Chromatography will come to a lot more detail later, but here the essential distinction is that our solids come into our column, but as they flow through our column, our column will also be regenerated. We'll elute, elute out those solids later on. So we're continuously regenerating that column for reusing one. Let's take a look at some, some examples that, you, uh, that have been well known for many, for many years. Um, for many, many years, people have been using charred wood products to filter their water to improve the water taste. And to uh, bone char, in fact, uh, will also, it's a type of activated carbon, will decolorize water. So especially water streams that come from rivers where there's a lot of soluble plant material, that water's colored um, and has some taste components from that vegeta vegetation matter. If we pass those through charred wood, charred bone, it removes that color, it removes that taste of the veg vegetation products. That's been known for many, many years. Well, you've probably seen adsorption a lot of those, for example, those reader filters, or any time you buy a large electronic component like a television or a computer or something like that, you get those little white sachets of stuff in there. That's silica gel. It's an adsorbent to keep moisture up. So we've seen these types of adsorbents before. Ion exchange we've just uh, spoken about, uh, but that's been known for many years that certain sand deposits will uh, we'll do that. So the ion exchange resin is actually a naturally occurring adsorbent, um, as is some of these, these ones up here um, that have been known to for, for many years. But in industry, when adsorption really picked up and became a useful unit operation was in 1960s, when we were able to take naturally occurring ion exchange resins and naturally occurring adsorbents and make them synthetically in the laboratory. 
So we'll, I'll show you what a molecular zeolite looks like, but that really took off in the 1960s. These zeolites have got some very great properties that really made adsorption work uh, on a large scale. So we didn't have to rely on naturally occurring deposits for these. So a number of important concepts on this next slide. So purple, font, uh, purple color is always a, a definition. Um, I put, I've updated the slides since I posted them online. There's these, uh, this terminology over here was in fact on your last slide. Okay, so it is in your notes already on the very last slide. I just brought it forward over here. The reason why I've done that is I want to talk a bit about what's coming in this section. So I thought to, to, to talk about it now. So we can see, so we can see where we're going in the next few classes. And adsorbent. If we look really closely at the adsorbent and both and, and zoom in on it, we have the, in the shaded region the adsorbent is a solid particle. The solute of interest binds to that particle surface. So on the outer surface of the, the adsorbent, but also this incredibly porous structure of the adsorbent. So these adsorbents are typically almost 50% open. Very, very porous materials. We're using this, these open pores primarily. We're not, the outside surface is a very small fraction of the total surface area available. It's the inner pores, these cylindrical pores, so they're circular in shape, these tortuous pores, cylindrical pores, so they've got a very high surface area on the, on the inner surface of that cylinder. Obviously, these pores, if we conceptualize them as being cylinders, the key variable that defines the surface area available to us is that pore diameter. So we'll see a lot referred to pore diameters in the next few slides. We'll quantify those pore diameters They're in the order of angstroms. We'll talk about that in a minute. So very small pore diameters, but incredibly high surface area because about, if I took a whole particle of this adsorbent, about half of it is porous and available for my solutes to come into those pores and attach to that particle surface through Van der Waals forces. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a bond between the surface of the, of the adsorbent and the molecule. <coughs> now there's several mechanisms that were registered from an engineering perspective that are taking place here. We'll look at those over the next few days. The first is there's an equilibrium interaction. Out here in the bulk, I've got my solid and my, my solute and my fluid. So let's say I've got a particular solute that I'm interested in retaining, and I've got the fluid that that solute is, is moving in. So out here in the bulk is a certain concentration of that solute, and there's going to be an equilibrium relationship between the concentration of the solute in the bulk versus the concentration deep down here in the pores. <coughs> So that solute is going to preferentially bind to the surface here. I'm going to have an increase in the concentration of that solute down here in the pores compared to the solute concentration out here in the bulk. And there's an equilibrium relationship. There's also kinetics, diffusion, that are taking place. The solute is going to diffuse into these pores, deep into the adsorbent pores. So there's some kinetic limitations that are, are taking place there. Especially when I'm dealing with multiple solutes. One, one solute may have a greater diffusivity over the other, which will then lead it to being preferentially um, retained inside the adsorbent. Then there's also steric effects, shape effects. So that pore structure will hinder and retain certain molecules or certain shapes. So if the molecule is bigger than that pore diameter, or if it's, it might be that it can be oriented as a long molecule, so it can get in there in, in a long orientation, but once it's in, it can't move around and, and get out again easily. Okay, so we, we see our pores have some steric interaction with the molecules themselves, so shape interaction. Um, so that actually becomes really important when you're trying to separate isomers from each other. Isomers of different shapes, the one isomer, isomer may, might preferentially be able to enter over the other one. So we're going to see these coming up in the next few classes. Just a bit of um, familiar concepts, just to recap. If we 
just to look at the length scales over here, one meter is 100 centimeters, 100,000 millimeters, um, and 10 to the 6 microns. So we've dealt up to microns right now in the membrane topic. So we're comfortable with microns. Nanometers 10 to the 9. Nanometers equals a meter, and then angstrom 10 to the 10. So we're, we're progressively, as this course is going on, we're getting to smaller and smaller sizes that we're interested in. So for reference, a hydrogen or helium atom is in the order of one angstrom in size. Pore diameters then for these adsorbents range between 10 and 200 angstroms to give you an idea of, of the general size. There is a way also to quantify what's going on here. If we consider our pore to be a perfect cylinder, that internal surface area of that cylinder is pi d times the length of the cylinder. The pore volume then, pi d squared times the length of the pore. Okay, so what's more useful and interesting to us is that ratio of surface area to volume. So how much surface area do I get per unit volume? And that's purely a function of the pore diameter. We really could, we could never actually estimate pore length. Realistically, we would never be able to measure pore length, but it's fortunate that it cancels out. Because really what we are only interested in is specific surface area per unit volume. And that comes down to being a function purely of the pore diameter. We want a high surface area per unit volume. Large surface area per unit volume, small pore diameters. So let's take a look then at, um, with that in mind, let's take a look at a few adsorbents. I, I will just go through these. I think it's important that we look, understand what they look like so when we see those topics coming up, we understand what's going on here. So this is aluminum, um, activated aluminum. It's made from aluminum hydroxide, and these are fairly large particles that are just simply compressed together in balls so that they can be packed into a column. But in, inside that pack ball, is, it's, a, it's a large porous structure of aluminum hydroxide. A moderate sized surface area, 300 meters squared per gram, that's not too large, but it is still pretty substantial. So a gram of that material would have about the surface area the size of this room. So it's uh, almost just slightly smaller than this room. One single gram of that material. It's, it's the most widely used absorbent and it's hydrophilic, so it's, it's used for those water type uh, demoisture, uh, moisture. Four diameters on the order of 10 to 75. What's also widely used is activated carbon. Uh, this is made from a variety of natural sources, coconut shells, nuts, wood, even sewage sludge that we saw up in sedimentation. We can take that sewage sludge and these natural products. We can heat them up, which is the activation step, and that adsorbent now can then be used in the future. Um, these have much greater surface areas per, per unit mass, um, and pore diameters that range on between 10 to 50. What's important here is the hardness of that. And then I'll just introduce the final one, um, is zeolites. So zeolites are very, very rigid lattices, and they're created they occur naturally, but they're also created synthetically. Um, there is a very defined ratio between the atoms over here. There's a formula that defines the, the relative ratios. But the key is that as I change those ratios, I get larger and larger openings inside what's called the alpha cage and then the beta cage. So that those group of molecules in the corner, they're also open. Very, very specific pore diameters can be measured to very, very precise size. And what's nice is that there's no distribution in pore diameters. All the pores are identically sized because this is a crystal lattice. Um, so these are very, very high selectivity. Okay, so they can absorb a very specific molecule size that gets trapped inside those, uh, those cages. Okay, so what we'll do next class is we'll uh, continue looking on on these topics. Uh, feel free to read ahead and we'll start looking at